despite all the geeking out about AI from a technological perspective right now, at the end of the day, all any of us wants is human connection. And we all love touch and contact and skin on skin. Okay, I mean, that is a fundamental human truth. Cindy Gallup, who is the face of the social sex revolution, joins Creativity Squared again. Cindy is the founder and CEO of Make Love Not Porn, the world's first and only user-generated, human-curated social sex video sharing platform. Its mission is to end rape culture by socializing and normalizing sex and promoting good sexual values and behavior. With over 30 years in the advertising industry, Cindy is an outspoken advocate of diversity and inclusion in advertising, tech, and business. She consults with brands on radical, breakthrough, innovative, and transformative ways to change the game in their industries. In our first conversation, Cindy shared her solution to end deep fakes, which disproportionately target women. Her answer, fund female founders. As she shared, we haven't fully realized the potential of the internet and technology through the female lens, one in which we will all be safer, happier, and making more money, including men. In today's episode, you'll learn how you can easily fund our guest female founder in just a couple of clicks, support Cindy scaling her core business, and building out the Make Love Not Porn Academy for the best sex education based on age appropriateness on the web. This is Cindy's first ever equity crowdfunding campaign led by actress Jamila Jamil and hosted on the WeFunder platform. In today's conversation, Cindy shares the importance of Make Love Not Porn's revenue sharing model and user ownership of content and data. We also discuss why Cindy pioneered the sex tech category her thoughts on AI, intimacy, and the loneliness epidemic, where sex tech is today, and where it can go beyond just the hardware. Cindy also shares how sex tech can be used in gaming and messaging to improve our human-to-human sexual interactions and relationships. She also shares the value of human connection and touch in an increasingly tech-driven world. Cindy accurately predicted sex in self-driving cars. What are her other sex tech predictions? Listen in to find out. Enjoy. But have you ever thought, what if this is all just a dream? Welcome to Creativity Squared. Discover how creatives are collaborating with artificial intelligence in your inbox, on YouTube, and on your preferred podcast platform. Hi, I'm Helen Todd, your host, and I'm so excited to have you join the weekly conversations I'm having with amazing pioneers in the space. The intention of these conversations is to ignite our collective imagination at the intersection of AI and creativity to envision a world where artists thrive. Cindy, welcome back to Creativity Squared. It's so wonderful to have you on the show again. Thank you, Helen. Always a pleasure. Well, since our last conversation, uh, which was right before Valentine's Day and the Super Bowl, uh, you've uh, been busy launching a crowdfunding campaign. So I thought we would kick off the conversation and let you share uh, what you're up to with this crowdfunding campaign. Thank you. Um, Well, yes, um, you know, we have just launched last month our first ever Make Love Not Porn equity crowdfunding campaign. And the reason it's our first ever is because, as has unfortunately been par for the course for the past 15 years with every piece of business infrastructure, previously, no crowdfunding platform would touch us with a barge pole. Um, because because Make Love Not Porn is a sex tech business. And the only reason that we've been able to make this breakthrough and actually launch an equity crowdfunding campaign is because the wonderful actress Jamila Jamil um, of The Good Place, um, She-Hulk, um, she's a big fan of Make Love Not Porn. She interviewed me for her podcast for her iWay community um, last year. And she's actually very keen to encourage her community to fund female founders. 
And so she proposed very kindly that she lead an equity crowdfunding campaign for us as the lead investor. And so she got WeFunder to embrace us. And that's how we were able to launch just last month. And I would love to encourage all of our listeners to please go to wefunder.com slash make love not porn and consider investing. Um, minimum investment is $100, so you can invest at any level level you like. But um, in the you know four weeks since we launched, uh, we're already up to $260,000. We're targeting a million in total. And honestly, I am just so moved by the messages that people are sending with their funding about, you know, um, how much they want Make Love Not Porn to exist, how important it is for the world. You know, we need to fund the female lens on the future. So, um, so yes, I would love um, everybody listening to check out our equity crowdfunding campaign and become an investor in Make Love Not Porn because I am determined to do my damnedest to add several zeros to whatever you put in. Well, congratulations on that first milestone. And I'll be sure to uh, put all of the links uh, to how you can find the WeFunder campaign in the description. And I have become an investor, so I definitely encourage uh, all of our listeners. It's very easy. It takes a couple of minutes and you don't have to be an accredited investor. That's one of the beautiful things about these crowdfunding campaigns. Anyone can really contribute and be and be part of the success. And I'm also a huge fan of, what is it, The Good Life? Uh, it's such a great philosophical um, uh, TV series too. In for those who didn't listen to our first interview, which I highly encourage you, one of the the main themes that uh, Cindy addressed was, you know, how do we prevent deep fakes? And the answer is fund female founders. And here's an opportunity to do that right now by supporting Cindy. And one of the things, so I, I think if I understand it correctly, the funding will go specifically to the Make Love Not Porn Academy. Is that correct? So basically... Um, what raising this funding will enable us to do is um, scale the core business, but very importantly, finally build what parents and teachers have been literally begging me for for the past 15 years, which is the zero to 18 and beyond sex education expansion of Make Love Not Porn, Make Love Not Porn dot Academy. And if our listeners go to that URL, they'll see my vision laid out there. But basically, this is what I characterize as the Khan Academy of Sex Education. Because Khan Academy, the online tutoring platform, tutors on every other topic under the sun except this one. Educational technology, EdTech, is exploding as a sector not in this area. So I want to build the academy on the same principles as Make Love Not Porn TV, which is user-generated, crowdsourced, curated revenue share. Because I'm not about reinventing the wheel. This is an aggregation play. I want to build the go-to global hub for the best of the world's sex education content. And so the way it works is when we have this funding, we build a platform and we will invite sex educators all around the world to share with us their own content, coursework, materials, books, videos, comic strips, whatever it may be. And I use the term educator very broadly, you know, to, um, sexual health and wellness experts, therapists, anybody informing and educating this entire area. Now, we will curate because at the heart of everything we do at Make Love Not Porn lies human curation. Human eyes will vet every piece of content before we publish it to make sure it's safe, we endorse it. And we will then publish all of this content segmented by age appropriateness. So if you're a parent freaking out going, oh my God, my six-year-old just asked me this, what do I say? You know, uh, we will provide the t entirely age appropriate tools and content to be able to have that conversation with a six-year-old. You know, if you're a teacher of a class of 14-year-olds, here are your age-appropriate teaching materials. If you're an adult, access all areas. Adults are just as desperate for information about all of this. But the important thing, Helen, is that the academy will be where children and young people can access sex education without parental teacher gatekeeping. And here's why that's important. 
So um, I have a friend who's a mother, and as you have to these days, she monitors her kids' browsing history. And this happened a few years ago. Her son was eight years old. And she saw to her horror that on the family computer, he had Googled sex for children. So she freaked out, but did the right thing, stayed calm, sat him down, you know, darling, you know, I see you were looking for this, just explain to me why. And this anecdote is adorable and horrifying in equal measure, because her son wanted about sex. He was a child, he knew he was a child, he wanted to learn about sex in a child-appropriate way. He sweetly, innocently Googled sex for children you can imagine the kind of thing that came back, utterly traumatized. And so the academy will be when an eight-year-old boy can enter his age and we will only serve him age-appropriate sex education content. Now, some of this will be free to access, per that example, but we'll also charge to download, subscribe, bulk buy if you're a school. There are different revenue streams of different use cases. And we will then split the income 50-50 with its creators, the educators, in the same way that we currently do with our Make Love Not Porn stars. Because right now, nobody goes into sex education to make money. I have friends all around the world who are brilliant sex educators. They face all the same problems I do. Their content gets blocked on Facebook, Instagram, et al. You know, their accounts get suspended or deleted. They're banned from advertising. They can't even make a living doing this. They've had to take other jobs to survive. And I want to change that because this is enormously valuable work. But I have three other agendas with the Academy. The first is when I can build an educational component for Make Love Not Porn, I reframe Make Love Not Porn. I give us social legitimacy. The second thing is, you know, given my challenges, because we are banned from advertising anywhere, um, I believe in building solutions to my own problems. I designed the academy to be a very effective growth engine for the core business, because when you're 18 and over, you can graduate to sex education through real world demonstration. We can send all the parents, teachers and adults straight through to make love, not porn. But the third reason is because I'm out to prove concept. And what I mean by that is, for years, people have said to me, oh, Cindy, you should go to schools. Make Love Not Porn should be on the curriculum. And I've always gone, no, I shouldn't, because anybody trying to bring sex ed into schools comes up against parent-teacher association, moral panic. Um, but here's the thing. The people keeping sex ed out of schools don't know what it'd be like if they allowed it in. They just know it'd be really bad. In their heads, they have this abstract concept, Sodom and Gomorrah will ensue. When I can show you what doesn't exist anywhere at the moment, all in one place, the best of the world's sex education content, and you can see for yourself at a glance how brilliant, informative, educational, healthy, and non-threatening it is. And when you can search according to age appropriateness and sensibility, because we'll have Christian sex education, Muslim sex education, Jewish sex education, that is when I can get sex ed in schools. And in fact, one investor said to me, Cindy, the moment 100 schools sign on to the academy, you're looking at a completely different value proposition. So that's the game plan. And that's what funding us at WeFunder will enable us to build and launch. Oh, I'm so excited to be part of it, have you on the show to talk about it and uh, see you hit the the 1 million mark uh, within the next month or so. Um, and one thing that came up, uh, actually, I, I just got back from South by Southwest and there was uh, a woman who was building a great um, platform to capture uh, Black uh, change makers. Um, and when it comes to scraping, um, I asked her what she thought about that. And she's like, we are not to be scraped. We will license our content. So I was wondering in the age of LLMs and all these AI chatbots, how you currently think about that with Make Love Not Porn and um, with the Academy and your plans, how you're thinking about uh, scraping versus licensing and data and privacy around all of your users and content? Sure. Um, to, um, so first of all, Helen, um, you know, a, a very important um, uh, component of Make Love Not Porn, which is true of the Academy as well, is, you know, um, with Make Love Not Porn, you know, 
our real world sex videos are the property of our make love not porn stars you know we um we have no ownership over them you know we showcase them on our platform which is the documentary to porn's hollywood blockbuster movie um but basically you know um our make love not porn stars are free to withdraw their videos the moment they want in fact our commitment to our make love not porn stars is the moment anything changes your relationship your life your circumstances even just your mind you tell us we take your videos down immediately you know they're gone and when i say immediately what i mean is you know we have no application form to fill in there is no online process there's no waiting period all you do is you message us and the moment we get your message you know we take your videos down within 15 minutes um, as happened the other day nobody else anywhere on the internet does that so where we come from is you know um th- um that content is the property of the contributor you know in the case of make love not porn the make love not porn stars in the case of make love porn academy the educators and you know if um we ourselves were to deploy that content anyway and so you know when we last spoke i talked about my ai plans for make love not porn and our algorithm for consent um we would absolutely ask our make love not porn stars for per- permission um to use their videos and and, and by the way there will be nothing identifiable um in in this particular usage context at all um but you know that's what we would always do ask permission um and, and by the way we have a very mission driven community so um i think permission would be very readily granted given the fact that the algorithm consent is designed to help end rape culture you know but equally the moment somebody no longer wants their videos on our platform we would withdraw that from everywhere including a large video model as well so it, it would be a dynamic model because it would be you know fluctuating depending on who had given their permission at any one time so um so you know w- w- where we come from is you know you have ownership of your content um and by the way we want you to make money out of that you know i designed make love not porn's revenue share model 15 years ago to democratize access to income in the same way that as i just said you know i want every sex educator i know to make a huge amount of money very deservedly for the very valuable work they're doing and so you know you own your content you make the money out of it and we help you do that well, one thing um we talk a lot about on this show is you know ai kind of has been forced uh forcing us to think about what makes us uniquely human and the last episode that came out we talked about uh human tears that they actually have uh depending on why you cry unique uh chemical composition uh to either heal or console or or whatnot and when it comes to sex i know you've said on many stages before that it's this beautiful messy wonderful thing uh about being human and as we think about the human condition uh in the age of ai what what do you want people to really i guess think about what makes us uniquely human from from the seat that you sit Well, Helen, at the risk of, you know, banging on endlessly about the same thing and repeating myself, I'm going to say I want people to take away from this particular part of our conversation fund female founders. And and I say that because um to to use an analogy, um historically in sex tech, which is the sector that I operate in, you know, people find it enormously uncomfortable to talk about sex. generally speaking um and this is true across the board including in the area of journalism and reporting and in tech journalism is dominated by men you know as all sex is dominated by men and tech journalists find it a lot easier and more comfortable to geek out on the side of sex tech that they feel a lot more comfortable talking about which is the hardware you know teledildonics vr porn you know sex robots it's a lot more uncomfortable to talk about the side of sex tech that i and many other female founders operate on which is the software using technology to bring people closer together in the real world and so historically infuriatingly all of the attention and coverage and funding has gone to the hardware 
And I bring this up because, you know, we are looking right now at a future of AI that is massively male dominated and is being designed and built through the male lens. And, you know, just as I've said for years, you know, which do you think is more important for the future of humanity? The technology that is about driving us further and further apart into our own little virtual worlds or the technology that's about bringing us closer together in the real world? Equally, you know, humanity in the era of AI depends on the female lens being as funded and as scaled as the male. You know, because we look at using AI completely differently and we are not geeking out on how you can live in a completely artificially generated world. We are not the ones deep faking porn all over the shop. You know, we are the ones building solutions to that. You know, and we are the ones who want to use technology to celebrate humanity and reward it and make it even better. You know, and, and you know, what I will say, um, Helen, is, you know, despite all the geeking out about AI from a technological perspective right now, at the end of the day, all any of us wants is human connection. And we all love touch and contact and skin on skin. Okay, I mean, that is a fundamental human truth. You know, um, th that is a key part, by the way, of the famous epidemic of loneliness we keep hearing about in all the media. You know, loneliness is as much about not touching somebody else as it is you know, engaging with or, or communicating with. I remember many, many years ago, um, uh, a girlfriend of mine who was stunningly gorgeous, very bright, and as is so often the case, um, spectacularly failing to find anybody nice to date. So she had not dated anyone a very long time. I, I remember her saying to me that she booked herself regular massages because she just thought it was enormously important to have her skin touched by somebody on a regular basis. And that was so moving and, by the way, so sad at the same time. And incidentally, I'm happy to report that this girlfriend did indeed find true love with an amazing man that she's been with for many, many years. So it all you know, ended up happily. But, but that is all any of us really want. And it doesn't matter you know, how much you're an early tech adopter or how much you geek out and nerd out over AI or whatever, you know, we all want human connection and the desire for that is never going to go away. But, you know, we will see less and less of how we can preserve that in the era of AI unless female founders get funded. So beautifully put. Um, and as you were saying that, it made me think just the other day on Instagram, I saw a review of a massage robot. Um, we're seeing humans being removed from human to human contact, uh, which is striking. And that destroys the point of a massage. Because again, you know, what you want is, you know, a massage is a very empathetic, sensitive connection between the, um, you know, in this case, a massage technician in the human sense of, of the term and, and the person being massaged because, you know, um, you want that human checking in with you as they do, you know, how is the pressure? Is it too deep, etc. You know, you want um, that human sensing, you know, what the knots in your back mean. Um, you will not get that from a robot. You know, it, it's not a mechanical process. Yeah, and going back to I guess last week's interview of what can be automated and what can't, there's like there's something to human presence and energy that just can't be replicated, and I think that highlights that. Uh, but one thing I didn't know, and uh, before our first interview that I discovered afterwards, is that you actually get credit for inventing the sex tech uh, coin for the industry, uh, which I thought was very cool. Um, so could you kind of give us a glimpse? Because you mentioned the geeking out of the hardware, kind of the the beginning, since you're the pioneer of the sex tech, um, where it's at um, and where where it's going to. Because um, I didn't realize that I was speaking to the the inventor of sex tech. I should explain for our listeners um, why that is the case, because. Honestly, Helen, that was born out of desperation. And, and what I mean by that is 10 years ago, 
I was trying to raise funding for Make Love Not Porn and Spectacularly Failing. And I realized that I was going to have to pave my own way. You know, I was going to have to break down these barriers in my path because, as I like to say, when you have a truly world-changing startup, you have to change the world to fit it, not the other way around. And so that's why 10 years ago, I deliberately set out to define, pioneer and champion my own category, sex tech. And I did that purely to create a climate of receptivity amongst investors by giving Make Love Not Porn somewhere to live, but by legitimizing my own category. So I literally wrote the definition of sex tech. If you Google sex tech, I'm result one on page one. And sex tech is any form of technology or tech venture designed to innovate, disrupt, and enhance in any area of human sexuality and human sexual experience. I coined the hashtag sex tech. And by the way, I didn't invent the term, but I'm directly responsible for propagating it as widely as it's used today. And I began speaking at tech conferences all around the world on why the next big thing in tech is sex tech. Because I thought at base level, if I just say this loudly enough, often enough, in enough places, people start to believe it. And they did. You know, 10 years later, sex tech is a thing. It's a known category. And, you know, as, as you've um, said, I am acknowledged as being, you know, the godmother of sex tech. Um, and it's basically, um, you know, legitimized as a category in a way that enables all of us who work within it to be able to point to a sector and, and to, you know, over time, because this is a slow process, you know, give it more and more legitimacy, um, you know, give it more and more financial gravitas. Um, you know, we, we are still waiting for what needs to happen, which is either the really big exit or the really big IPO, you know, which um, we haven't had in, in this category as yet. But, but you know, to, um, th um, that really was um, the, um, the reason that I pioneered um, the concept of sex tech. Now, now, to your question about the future, here's, um, here's what's interesting, because, you know, because we're so narrow-minded about sex, um, and because historically, you know, no one was ever encouraged to be an entrepreneur in this area, people still have absolutely no concept of what the sex tech sector could be. And what I mean by that is, if you mention the word sex tech, most people think sex toys, sex robots. That's about as far as their you know, imagination goes. And, you know, I have a very unique vision for sex tech. Um, and in fact, I wanted and still want to at some point raise the world's first dedicated sex tech fund because I see the financial potential. But um, um, my vision depends on what I'm doing with Make Love Not Porn right now, which is socializing sex spearheading the social sex revolution because there is huge opportunity um, to bring sex tech applications to numerous sectors that have historically, you know, banned or censored them. So, so for example, um, gaming. Okay. And I, I bring up gaming because, you know, for many years I've championed women in tech, women in business, and as I think we all know, gaming is one of the most sexist areas of tech. Um, I know a ton of brilliant female game designers and game developers who have not been able to start their own studios because they can't get funded, you know, same old, same old. But um, I'll give an example of what I mean. So, so one of my friends is a brilliant Phoenix Perry, who's a game designer who's based in London. And many years ago, she said to me, Cindy, I want to build you a Make Love Not Porn game. And I went, oh, my God, when I have funding, you bloody bet, because I knew exactly what she meant. Because when I talk about bringing sex set to gaming, I don't mean sex in games. What I mean is the ability to design and build games that actually, as you play them, improve your ability to interact sexually in the real world. You know, games that enable you to explore your sexuality. Uh, and by the way, these do not exist, you know. And so 
And so there's a huge opportunity for gaming sex tech that hasn't even begun to be real. Um, then, you know, um, other areas are, um, and, and, you know, th um, this is one where um, I actually have a product in the pipeline that, that I want to raise funding for to build myself. Um, but messaging. And the reason I, I bring that up is because apps like Snapchat and WhatsApp refuse to admit that their exponential growth, huge rounds of funding, gigantic IPOs have been driven by one thing and one thing only, sexting. And, and they literally refuse to admit it. I mean, I've seen interviews where they won't answer questions about it. They evade any mention. Here's the problem. When A, refused to admit that sexting is a perfectly normal, universal human activity. B, refused to admit that a shit ton of it goes on in your app. You then do not proactively design for it. You don't design for privacy, confidentiality, security, and consent. And that is why we have a huge revenge porn problem globally. So when I talk about socializing um, tech in, in the context of sex, you know, I want to build, I've talked about this publicly for years, I want to build the Make Love Not Porn openly, healthily, unashamedly dedicated to sexting, safe sexting app. It's called Cosensual. You know, I've registered the name, bought URL, all of that. And it does two things. It enables you to sext completely safely and securely, you know, using state-of-the-art cyber security, um, you know, inability to screen cap, inability to screen record. Everything lives within the app. Nothing goes to the other person's phone. But the second thing it does, um, because, again, this is the only app where you're going, this is for people to sext. The second thing it does, because this is what we're all about to make love, not porn, is it has built-in features designed to improve your communication around sex to improve your sexual relationship. So, for example, you know, Coast Central will have our equivalent of Snapchat's filters. We'll have summary generated because we'll also um, create your own. And you can overlay these filters on your sexy videos, photos you're sharing with each other. But what our filters do is they say things like, I really love it when you do that. Actually, I'm not so keen when you do that. I would really rather you did not do that. In other words, they make it easy to communicate what people find impossible to say face to face in bed. You know, we have a ton of things like that. And so that's what I mean by bringing applications of sex tech to very big tech sectors where historically sex has been banned or excluded. Huge opportunity. It's brilliant. And I know just in relationships I've had, I'm very, very strict about the types of photos I share and don't share on text, because if it were to get online, it, women get the most harm done. And some of the guys I've dated just don't understand why. And it's like, I don't feel comfortable because if your phone got hacked, my phone got hacked, like who knows what happens. So um, uh, having a safe environment for that uh, is, is a brilliant idea. And since you mentioned not geeking out on the hardware, um, I, I did think it would be worth sharing uh, just because I know I learned from uh, Bryony Cole, who's the founder of the Future of Sex podcast. We were both speakers at South by One Year about how some sex tech is really opening um, the doors for inclusiveness, uh, even through the lens of um, sex toys um, with like disabilities in mind. And since, you know, not everyone's had the pleasure of getting to meet her or you, I thought this would be kind of an interesting opportunity to share um, about the inclusive opportunities um, when it comes to sex tech as well. No, no absolutely. So, so I'm an advisor to a wonderful company called Bumpen. Um, you can find them at getbumpen.com, um, B-U-M-P-N.com, um, which was founded by um, Heather Morrison and her brother, Andrew Gerza. Andrew is disabled. And what Bumpen does is it basically creates sex toys by disabled people for disabled people. But, but the wonderful thing about it is, it's like anything else. When you, when you make the world more accessible for people with disabilities, you make it more accessible for all of us. You know? And so their first sex toy is hands-free. It's called the joystick. When they first told about it, I went, oh, my God, I love that idea because, you know, my hand cramps when I have to hold my vibration place for too long. You know? So that's something everyone can benefit from. 
Um, and, and so, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, to, um, the, the future of sex tech includes all sorts of opportunities um, to, you know, make things far more accessible. And another example is um, the wonderful Glenice Kinnard Moore. So she's a black female founder based in Atlanta. And so she um, invented the VDOM because she wanted to be able to make love to her wife spontaneously. And so she created this brilliant prosthetic, um, which completely reinvents the strap on and makes it life so much easier because um, it comes with, the VDOM comes with its own special pair of briefs that it fits into. Um, it's, it, it inflates and deflates at will. And what that means is it's not only obviously fantastic for, you know, lesbian couples as Denise and, and the wife are, but it's fantastic for anybody with erectile dysfunction issues, you know, um, cancer survivors, you, you, know, um, you know, people who, um, for whatever reason, need that sort of assistance. And I just think that's absolutely genius, you know. And again, when you make things more accessible, it improves um, the world for all of us. It came up in the interview with uh, Alejandro that uh, we should really not be designing for the average because that's actually excludes people that we should be um, designing for the extremes. And especially when you design for the most marginalized, as you said, you, you lift everyone up. So I, I couldn't um, agree more. Well, oh, and when it comes to sex tech and predictions, uh, you said on one interview or somewhere where I got it that um, we'll see people having sex in these uh, self-driving cars. And I heard on the Hard Fork episode, which uh, I love with um, Casey Newton and Kevin Roos, that they pretty much predicted that that's what happened in one of the Waymo cars because out of nowhere, all of a sudden, there were more cameras and announcements like uh, reminding people that they were being filmed. Uh, so I was curious, um, uh, that was such a, a great prediction that we've already seen. What other predictions that you have uh, in the sex tech uh, space as well? Well, you know, the, the way I'd contextualize this, um, to be frank, Ellen, is that, you know, Whatever's out there, it's a bit like rule 34 of the internet goes, if it exists, there is porn of it, okay? Um, Gallup's rule of sex tech goes, you know, um, if the tech exists, it can be sex tech. And the fact of the matter is that people, people will have sex on, around, under, over, in the vicinity of anything. <laughs> so, you know, th th this goes back to my point about you know, when you acknowledge that openly, you can design for it. You know, so if I were Waymo, um, I would absolutely be designing a self-driving car specifically to be able to have sex in. You know, um, to, uh, I've made this point in, in a broader context, um, which is, you know, um, and, and, and this is part of me trying to open up my industry's minds, you know, advertising, brand marketing, to understand what they're missing out on but they, when they don't acknowledge this universal human experience and, and, and capitalize on it. So, you know, what I say to people is all around the world, people have sex in cars, especially in markets where for sociocultural reasons, you know, premarital sex is frowned upon. In markets where young people live at home until they get married, which, by the way, given the economy is now the US <laughs> as well as, you know, Asia or, or Italy or wherever. In markets where, you know, this is especially the case in Asia, where whole families live together commonly in households. So even husbands and wives can't find privacy to be intimate. So all around the world, a huge number of people are having a huge amount of sex in a huge number of cars. But the automotive industry is spectacularly failing to factor that into product design and marketing. Even more fundamentally, people have sex in bed, but the mattress industry focuses all its R&D on sleep. People have sex on kitchen counters, but the kitchen industry isn't taking that into account with height, depth, width, comfort. The point being, there is a far broader business application of all of this than simply within directly sex-related products. And companies and brands are leaving money on the table when they don't acknowledge that and design for it 
and market it accordingly. I hope after everyone listens to this episode, they'll look at their uh, kitchen counter a little bit differently (laughs) or any of the products that they're working on, uh, if it's tied to that. Um, Well, one thing that uh, you had mentioned or that we talked about a little bit with um, uh, the robot um, massager and the AI chat girlfriends that we are seeing like a rise in this AI or loneliness in general, a loneliness epidemic, uh, but a rise in these AI girlfriends where people are finding somewhat of companionship with these fake things. And there's even an art piece I think we shared in one of our newsletters called uh, the first woman to marry a hologram. And in offline conversations, um, one guest on the show actually shared like, oh yeah, we'll be debating soon uh, for a human to marry a robot like that's inevitable i don't know if i share that view but it has come up in conversations i'm curious like what your thoughts are if there is any good that comes from these virtual um you know chat bot companionships if we should watch it with caution or uh yeah I'm, i'm just curious what your thoughts are in this moment in time as we're witnessing all of this Um, No, I absolutely think there is social benefit. I mean, if you think about use cases like elderly people who live alone um, and who are desperate for companionship, then, you know, I I think they can absolutely serve a useful purpose. Um, The the difficulty is that, you know, I mean, in the same way, we will anthropomorphize anything. You know, we will convince ourselves that an animal is talking to us or, you know. um, and, And so I think the danger is in, you know, attributing things like common sense to them, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, mentally giving them qualities that they do not possess. You know, I think, I think that's where the danger lies. In the same way that, you know, using ChatGP to write your essay or make your law argument is a very bad idea, you know. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, th- I think... Um, there, there needs to be some way of reminding people that this is not another person, you know. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure, you know, exactly what that is, but, but, but I think that sort of framing is important, you know, to, um, to, to prevent, I mean, again, you know, um, in the same way that depressingly, um, the entire fraud industry keeps up with every possible development. And obviously now they're using AI to mimic like your child's voice when they tell you that they've been kidnapped and you've got to pay a ransom, et cetera. You know, um, it's entirely possible for bad actors to hijack um, these forms of AI in a way that could be very detrimental. And so, you know, some kind of reminder that this is artificial and this is not a real person, I think is very important. And, and I could see that actually being hard. Uh, I was listening to some interview the other day where a woman uh, had a robot dog and she knew it was a robot dog, but then before long she anamorphized it and was treating it like a real dog. And like that, that blurred line of what we know to actually be true and then how we act to it. And even I think Kevin uh, Roos in the last Hard Fork episode that I listened to was talking about the Apple Vision Pro that when he took it off, you know, the AR overlays of what was in his house, like he was still expecting to see them there so that there's this very much blurring of reality and not reality. So I I think that's very uh, important that, that you called that out, especially as things get way more blurred in our mind too. Um, you are so creative and have so much experience in the advertising industry. One of my guests, Claire Silver, she actually tweeted this, that we're leaving the information age and we're entering the imagination age where it's not so much what you can do or your productivity. It's really about the value of your ideas and your imagination, um, that that's what the real value will be as we leave the information age and enter the imagination age. So I'm curious, um, because you've mentioned before, we haven't yet seen the full realization of the internet through the female lens. What gets you excited from a creativity, sex tech, female lens um, in in the imagination age? Yeah, well, what I would say to that, um, quite frankly, Helen, again, I'm going to sound like, you know, um, I just keep repeating myself, but you know, you cannot make that sweeping statement 
when the creativity and imagination of women is not being welcomed and not being funded. And I'm, I say that across the board. I mean, one really obvious place is Hollywood. Movies, TV, you know, male-dominated, male studio heads, male showrunners, goddamn superhero movies out the wazoo. You know, no, female creativity and imagination is not being respected, not being welcomed, not being backed, not being championed, not being funded, not being given free reign. So that's my view on the imagination age. The imagination age is missing the imagination of half the population. I'm absolutely serious about that. You know, and it's the same point that I make when I say that because only 1.7% of all venture capital goes to female founders, we have not yet seen what the future of the internet could be designed and built through the female lens. So, um, you know, the world is a poorer place because of that. We live in a world where the default setting is always male. And, you know, I've said to men for years, men, you have no idea how much happier you would be living in a world that was 50-50 equally designed, led, managed, and manifested by, by all of us. So that's my view. You know, we do not have an imagination age until the imagination of half the population is welcomed and championed and funded and supported in the way the imagination of the other half is. Oh, I, of course, fully agree. And one thing that was extremely um depressing to hear on uh, International Women's Day. I was at South by and there was a panel with, you know, all-star um, amount of women and actually female representation in film has decreased and a lot of measures of just uh, women representation in media has actually, you know, taken the four steps back and we're, uh, we're going backwards and stuff forward. So there's, there's definitely a lot of room, um, for improvement on that front as well. I read an article since you mentioned, um, you know, Hollywood and, you know, everything is the default is by the male lens. And I've talked to a few of my female friends before about this. There was a great article and I forget who wrote it um, that said that we don't need another female heroine, but more or less the point was taking a male hero and uh, substituting a female for it. And the point of the article was our entire reference point of what a hero is, is all pivoting around the male definition and benchmark. And that even from a female perspective, it's sometimes hard to unlearn that and understand what does a female leader mean? What does it mean to be a female hero? Um, and we have, you know, some fabulous women like yourself who are redefining that, but to maybe some of our female uh, listeners, because it's so ingrained in our society of our reference points and culture. Um, I, I'm really curious what your reactions or thoughts on, you know, just even redefining what it means to be a female leader, uh, given our society and where, where we're currently at. And, um, honestly, Helen, I just keep it very simple. You know, um, being a brilliant female leader is leading the way that you would naturally choose to lead. Okay. Um, you know, th th there's no point in twisting people up in knots even more by going, oh, my God, now I have to rethink being a leader and what's a female, you know. And, you know, I'll give you my own example. Over the years, um, a very standard interview question is, Cindy, what's your definition of, a le of leadership? What's the definition of a leader? My answer is always the same. A leader is somebody who puts their people ahead of themselves. Now, I feel very confident saying to you that a man would never give that answer. So you lead as a woman the way you naturally are inclined to lead, and then you're a female leader. Uh, I appreciate that. So thank you for sharing. Um, I think we're actually getting close to the end um, of our interview, uh, looking at the time. Um, one thing I did want to ask um, uh, before we hop off, because you have said before um, making money and doing good is something that you are a big proponent of and reimagining a more shared future. And one thing we mentioned it in our last interview and conversation too, is like how important it is to envision, um, or having a vision of what we want. Um, but I'd love to have you surface that in this conversation as well as we're, you know, imagining what the future of the internet and what could be, um, if you could share your thoughts on, yeah, what a shared future is to you. 
Um, you know, I think it's just, and again, you know, this is why I keep banging on about fun female founders, because we we build businesses with the female lens that are about making the world better for all of us. You know, um, honestly, you know, um, the world we would all want to live and work in is the world that women want to build and, and, and that we are not getting funded to make real and scale at the moment. You know, um, and it's as simple as that. You know, through the female lens is is how we will all be a whole lot safer, a whole lot better taken care of, a whole lot happier. And because of all that, that is a whole lot more lucrative. That's our future um, for, for the people who get it and are willing to fund female founders. That's a great segue to hit us home with our closing thoughts. Um, if you want to plug um, your WeFunder campaign one more time and any last thoughts that you want to leave our listeners and viewers with. Sure, happily. I mean, you know, obviously, listeners, you know, if you believe in funding female founders, and I'd love you to help fund me by going to WeFunder and micro-investing in Make Love Not Porn. Um, but, but also... You know, I would just say um, the single best thing you can do um, in any context for a better future for all of us is when you see a female founder building something you absolutely bloody love, um, fund or support her in any way you can, no matter how small. Help her get her show on the road. Tell people about it. Champion it. You know, send her words of encouragement um, because... Trust me, as female founders, we all need that because things are a lot more challenging for us than they are for male founders. And we need all the help we can get. That's a beautiful way to end the show. Cindy, thank you so much for coming back on, sharing more of your time. And uh, I know I've already invested in Make Love Not Porn and again, encourage all of our listeners and viewers uh, to do the same um, and go to creativitysquared.com and we'll have links uh, to everything we've discussed in today's episode. Um, so thank you again, Cindy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for spending some time with us today. We're just getting started and would love your support. Subscribe to Creativity Squared on your preferred podcast platform and leave a review. It really helps. And I'd love to hear your feedback. What topics are you thinking about and want to dive into more? I invite you to visit creativitysquared.com to let me know. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter so you can easily stay on top of all the latest news at the intersection of AI and creativity. Because it's so important to support artists, 10% of all revenue Creativity Squared generates will go to ArtsWave, a nationally recognized nonprofit that supports over 100 arts organizations. Become a premium newsletter subscriber or leave a tip on the website to support this project and ArtsWave. And premium newsletter subscribers will receive NFTs of episode cover art and more extras to say thank you for helping bring my dream to life. And a big, big thank you to everyone who's offered their time, energy, and encouragement and support so far. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. This show is produced and made possible by the team at Play Audio Agency. Until next week, keep creating. <laughs>